Hi there, Augie's away at Camp Papa, but I've got Lulu, and we're joining you once again from our studios at Casa Richard Productions in lovely far south Austin. And from across Texas, let's see what CTG viewers spotted in their gardens. We were bombarded with questions about why asters were blooming in May and early June. And like most creatures that find themselves out of sync, it's all down to the weather. Unseasonable cold was followed by unseasonable lack of sunshine and rain, seriously messing with the normal rhythms of many natural occurrences. And we're still learning more every day from the historic freeze that hit us all like a ton of bricks. Another big issue popped up and has remained prominent. Fungal populations exploded in all realms and in every conceivable space. From leaf spots to wood rot, fungi are everywhere. Andy Campbell lost a rough leaf dogwood and a three leaf sumac when fungal disease came on quickly. Recently, he planted a smoke tree that's looking troubled. He notes that he's got clay soil and that he's added a soil conditioner, compost, peat, and native soil along with decomposed granite and pebbles for drainage. We recommended that Andy prune out the diseased tissue and toss it, knowing that by the time new growth emerged, there'd be a better possibility for dry air and thus a less supportive environment for reinfection. And we were right. Andy reports that new growth is filling in and looking healthy. Rust is another common fungal disease. Ramona Rogan's daylily suffered with subtle splotchy leaves in March 2020. Jeff Breitenstein and Scotty O'Mahony from the Austin Daylily Society told us that rust is a common daylily disease, especially here in the South. With daylily rust, the recommendation is similar to other fungal diseases. Spray infected tissues with a registered fungicide according to label directions, then prune and toss the cut portions into the garbage. Viewers have good news too. Helen Johnson found a monarch caterpillar on a Budlia plant she'd gotten at a nursery. A few days later, she discovered its chrysalis on a container on the opposite side of her patio. And nine days later, her monarch emerged. She wrote, I can't tell you how excited I am to have had this happen on my little patio in Richmond, Texas. And we're excited for you, Helen. Ginger Magnuson was thrilled to watch no fewer than 22 gorgeous chubby chompers on her fennel, dill, and parsley, the host plants for these black swallowtail butterflies. She covered the plants with a netting of sorts to keep out cardinals and wasps. Then one day, the caterpillars were all gone. But as Helen discovered, these crafty critters can travel quite a ways to pupate in Cedar Park. Jim and Angie O'Donnell spotted an adult pandarus sphinx moth, also called a hawk moth, because they're so large that often they're mistaken for hummingbirds. As adults, they nectar on many flowers, as do monarch and swallowtail butterflies. The host plants for these moth caterpillars are grapevines and native Virginia creeper. But Pratap Singh ran into some problems with his bitter melons. In the night, something cut the stem about six inches above the ground. Since he hasn't seen the culprit, either insect or animal, he built a cage that's buried about an inch and a half around the plant. When he spots a snail eating the leaves, he removes it. And now his bitter melons are thriving and there's no more damage. His cucumbers are doing well too, and he's protecting a yard-long bean plant with a recycled plastic bottle. Way to upcycle, Pratap! Next year, he plans to start seedlings in small containers so that they can put on a healthy amount of growth before being transplanted into the ground. Pratap also cages his tomatoes. He makes his own sturdy ones since he's discovered that his indeterminate varieties can get six feet tall, quickly overgrowing the standard hoop cages. His method, first get T posts and then attach wire mesh. As plants grow taller, tie branches to the wire. The open mesh allows for easy picking of ripened fruit. Most of us lost at least a plant or two in February's hard hit, but we've also been reminded that our plants truly are quite resilient. Camille Feliz snapped a shot of her two-year-old Peggy Martin Rose after the extended freeze and look at it now. This stunning beauty is known as a Katrina rose since specimens of it survived 20 feet of salt water in gardener Peggy Martin's New Orleans yard during Hurricane Katrina. Camille told us of her rose. She's salt water and snow hardy. It's so renewing and heartwarming to see the things that do return after what they went through this February. My heart cheers for them when I see the comebacks. 
Mark Sepulveda cheerfully dubs his backyard as the Garden of Chaos. The freeze wiped out most of his succulent bed, but he's starting over with smaller cacti and fun statues. We like his philosophy, as Mark says, one thing about gardens, you can change them, whatever. Our bay laurel trees certainly took a hit, but they're coming back with gusto. In Round Rock, Jan Keens was almost 20 feet tall when the freeze got it. They cut it back and have documented its speedy growth over the past several months. By late May, it was over two feet tall, tripling in height since April. Magnolias in Arkansas didn't miss out on a glorious spring season. Our friend Roy Wilson documented their beauty in these remarkable photographs. In Fayette County, Agnes Ficus renewed the spring garden with a border of fragrant alyssum against yarrow, salvias, and other pollinator perennials coming back. We can attract lots of pollinators with container plants too. A hummingbird quickly zoomed into this Manfreda flower when Sarah Robertson, Senior Vice President for Production at Austin PBS, freshened a container this spring. And finally, here's a great native perennial that attracts pollinators and handles our weather mood swings with ease. Rock Rose, Pavonia lasiopetala. It was recently named a Texas superstar for its long blooming season and tolerance to heat and drought. Growing to about two to four feet tall and equally as wide, Rock Rose functions as a small shrub in warmer USDA hardiness zones 9 to 13 and as a woody subshrub or herbaceous perennial in cooler zones 8 and 7. It grows as far north as Lubbock and can be grown as a summer annual or container plant in colder climates. Related to native hibiscus species, Rock Rose produces two inch diameter pink flowers from spring until frost if good growing conditions are maintained. It tolerates most soil types, but needs good drainage and does best when pruned back to a height of six to eight inches each year, just prior to the emergence of new growth in spring. Plant in full sun to bright shade. We'd love to hear from you. Click on centraltexasgardener.org to send us your pictures, questions, stories, and videos.